Welcome to the School of Chemical Engineering's interview series. Uh, today we're really pleased to be talking to Dr. Chris Roberts, CEO of Cochlear. When I did chemical engineering, my electives, my, my choices were in biological the biological process engineering direction. So dairy and cheese making and, the, and those sort of, sort of electives. And in my final year of uh, chemical engineering, my, uh, I did an experimental design thesis in uh, um, artificial kidney treatment, dialysis. And that was fascinating because, uh, and I was really blown away by the fact that basic chemical engineering problems could keep people alive. Dialysis is where you have cross-flow filtration, so you're taking blood out of the body, maybe 200 mils a minute, and you're passing it via semi-permeable membrane. You get small molecular weight solutes diffusing across. You put a pressure gradient across that membrane, you can drive fluid across. And people stay alive for years using basic chemical engineering processes, and that really blew me away. So that got me in medical devices, and I've stayed in medical devices for uh, the last 38 years on, on the back of, of that, uh, that experience. I had the opportunity in my lifetime to sit at the feet of some great entrepreneurs. Uh, um, Paul Trainer, who was the entrepreneur behind the, the Nucleus group of companies, mm -hmm. and that was the group that started Cochlear, the company I'm running now. I also uh, spent many years with uh, Dr. Peter Farrell, who, who was uh, it comes out of uh, the University of New South Wales and was the founder of ResMed and a great entrepreneur. And these people taught me how technology restructures markets, how technology is the fundamental turbocharger of growth for a company or a country. And I was really able to see that and inculcate that, that first hand. So while I've been interested in business and certainly do, of, of, um, uh, um, I made my roles have been in business, it's really been from a technology perspective, understanding how technology can drive these businesses. Well, there's a real move around, certainly the, the younger generation of uh, technological startups, and, and there's a much more entrepreneurial feel, certainly in the U.S. where I'm from, but uh, I think here as well there's a feel for that. Do you see a change from when you were an undergraduate to now? No, I, th I think there's just as much, maybe more opportunity to do things today as, as there ever was. So uh, if you think about the history of, of uh, the prosperity of mankind, it's really been about being able to do two things, being able to specialise to do something well and to be able to trade it, to exchange it. So you need specialisation and trade, but if you think about that specialisation, it's where technology can, can really contribute very, very significantly. But uh, with the, the, the changing business context in the world, digitisation and, uh, and uh, communication revolution and the like, I think it's much, much easier than, than what it was several decades ago, where, where uh, um, Australia had the tyranny of distance uh, pro problem, for example. Uh, um, so I think the world, the, the world has changed very significantly, but not necessarily in a negative way for, for the entrepreneur today, and certainly not in a negative way in terms of being able to use technology. The, the biggest challenge we face in the world, uh, and we can see it actually over the history of mankind, that, that um, Innovation and technology, etc., implies change, and people hate change. One of the key things an entrepreneur has to come to grips with, all the obstacles, the barriers that are put up by everybody to the fundamental change that you try to drive. Now, the thing that I've found interesting in my life that I wish I'd learnt a lot earlier, and I'd wish I'd learnt when I was doing chemical engineering, and that is a lot more around the history of science. I think it's fascinating to go back and, and look at the history of science and particularly the role of technology in the history of science and how, how often technology came before the science that it, that because you can build something through trial and error. You can build something without knowing why it works or how it works, but it's often when you, because you've built it, because you have it, you can go and study about why it works and how it works. So often the technology comes before the science. And that's a very important concept, and I wish I'd learnt that decades ago. 
So you, you moved from sort of chemical engineering to a more biomedical focus and, and technological along with your business interests there. That's a fairly traditional move, but it's not necessarily something that everybody who enters into chemical engineering is aware of. For, from my point of view, it was great to do chemical engineering, but I did take it into a biomedical engineering direction, absolutely, and I very quickly did an MBA because I was interested in knowing the, 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 the broad disciplines relevant for, for, for business. And I, I had that view when I started chemical engineering, I could learn some of these things down the track, yeah. which I, I wanted to do. And it was useful to do the MBA to sort of understand what are the key principles behind marketing, for, for example. The other thing that had a big influence on me was doing a PhD, uh, and doing a PhD in engineering or biomedical engineering, and that tends to be a very personal thing, but I think I, I learned an enormous amount. And I've been very, very pleased uh, about how chemical engineering has helped me in business. The reason I say that is, uh, to me, running a business, Bill, is an exercise in design. It's that you've got to design the future. You, a, a business can't stand still. You either decline or you, or you go forward. But going forward is about building something. You can analyse the past all you like, but you have to design the future. And engineering is one of the very few disciplines that teaches you anything about design. There's a lot of good systems thinking and boundaries and constraints and trade-offs and all the sort of standard tools that we think of in chemical engineering are surprisingly useful at running a business. And the older I get, the more I realise I think like an engineer. So what are you currently excited about now from a business and from a technological perspective? I am excited in the area of, of cochlea, for example, in the area of hearing. We know that he hearing has, uh, is, uh, is a huge problem huge clinical problem, it's very prevalent, I mean it's a, it's a part of ageing, but it's not just an inconvenience of ageing, it has devastating consequences on you in terms of social isolation, the morbidity, mortality consequences of losing that ability to communicate a very significant uh, hearing loss as an independent risk factor for cognitive decline, for example. So uh, hearing, maintaining your hearing is, is an important part of healthy ageing, quite apart from how devastating it is for a child to be born deaf in terms of language development and communication and for an advanced country like Australia hearing loss is at least 1.4 percent of GDP uh, the sort of sort of cost um, but the positive news is we have interventions that can really fundamentally help people can give people the gift of get the get the gift of hearing but while we've been doing this journey for 30 years there's a lot more that we can we can do and that's what excites me. So we can we can fundamentally significantly improve hearing outcomes from what we're doing. We can improve lifestyle outcomes. We can we can expand indications in terms of the types of hearing problems that we can help and we can increase patient access because there's a huge disconnect between um, the number of people who need one of our implants globally and the number who actually get it. But we have to simplify, we have to automate, we have to use the digital world to connect people. We have to fundamentally think differently about how these clinical services are delivered. So it's not just about developing a product, but it's about developing a service that, that we can do as well. So fantastic opportunities for a company like, like Cochlear to, to really embrace the, uh, the way the, the world's going. It's an interesting concept too because I think some of the way people interact with society and each other is changing so much. I mean, it's much more device driven now, you know, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet or, or things like that. And so I imagine there must be some interesting uh, directions as well there, you know, where they might not necessarily be converging yet, but certainly the idea of, of people interacting via devices has opened up that possibility a lot more to society in the last decade than, than it would have 20 years ago. Exactly right, Patrick. I, th I think the big issue is that people are, are being empowered more themselves. Yeah. That's the, how the digital world. So it's about how to, and that's particularly relevant for a chronic condition as well. I mean, the, the healthcare system has been developed on acute care model, but the big challenges for the healthcare system today are chronic conditions. But for a chronic condition, the, the patient has to take 
personal responsibility for managing their obesity or their hypertension or, or their, their diabetes or whatever. The healthcare professionals can help, but they need to take some personal responsibility as well. But it's about how do we empower people to, to be able to, to do that. And we can do that with hearing, for sure. Great. One of the things we're interested in is how can we interact better? How can we have a more seamless sort of interaction with industry? You know, so from your perspective, what do you see academia being able to do better or more as a driver of research or, or a, you know, a driver of innovation and technology in partnership with industry? First, I've never worked in a university, but I'm a huge fan of the university sector glo globally. I think it's incredibly important and wonderful people and a wonderful environment that can uh, provide tremendous advances. Uh, so much so that uh, we've taken Cochlear, for example, and moved Cochlear onto an academic campus here at Macquarie University, where, where you are. And, and with the university, you created this hearing precinct. So when you came in the front door, you noticed the the, the Australian Hearing Hub building on the other side there and about half of that building is how houses departments from the university here focused on hearing. The other half houses other groups from Sydney non-university but it might be government or for-profit or not-for-profit involved in hearing. So we've created a precinct here of several thousand people co-located working on all different aspects of, of hearing. Now Cochlear we spent uh, maybe last year I think it's something like 120 million dollars on research and development. Um, that's a global spend and we would we would be working with at least 100 universities around the world. So we've actually as an organisation embraced research and development, embraced actually being part of a precinct on a university, but it's not only about this university, but embraced working with, with universities around the world. And I, th I, I uh, am a huge fan of, of the university sector and, and uh, what business can get out of university and vice versa. I mean, we need each other. This is uh, a, a collaborative effort. The other thing that's interesting from a hearing perspective, from what we're doing, we provide a relatively crude signal peripherally into the peripheral nervous system, but this works because of what the brain does centrally. And so it's all the advances that are occurring in neuroscience, and neuroscience is one of the fastest growing disciplines within medicine. It's about understanding the advances in neuroscience and how that can be applied to what we're trying to do with hearing. Now, we can't possibly be a leader in neuroscience. We have to, I mean, it makes much, much better sense to partner with people. But what we're doing here is, with this precinct, is, is creating a critical mass of activity that is, but to think of that as a catalyst for global collaboration. Um, and in fact, even some of the groups in here, if we take um, a major centre, the Centre for Cognition and its Disorders, that's a multi-university group, including uh, um, the University of New South Wales. You know, we, we really appreciate you taking the time out to talk to us and talk about these sorts of things. It's an evolving discussion, an evolving uh, topic, and it's great to get thought leaders like yourself's perspective on this sort of thing. So no, th th thank you very much, Patrick. I owe a lot to chemical engineering. It's, it's certainly shaped a lot of my thinking, and it's provided a wonderful uh, basis of a, of a career. Great. Well, we look forward to trying to be a part of that future as well, and working working with partners like yourself in that uh, in that journey. So, thanks again for the time. Thank you, Patrick.